<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, good morning and welcome to the second day of the conference. Those that were not here yesterday, my name is Mamo Troding, and I'm from the Water Research Commission of South Africa in the International Cooperations and Partnerships Division. And I'm going to be directing the plenary session today in the afternoon at 2.30 and again tomorrow morning. So you're still going to see a lot of me. I'm not yet done. So I think we really had a good um, day yesterday, a very good yet long but fruitful and worthwhile day. Um, where we, for example, especially from starting with the core conveners, they had in their remarks highlighted that they would really love to provide the platform and um, where we could engage with all stakeholders, government, policy, researchers, innovators, funders, investors, and so forth. And if you were around yesterday, you were able to see that that was happening. A lot of it was happening. So I think we managed to already start what the core conveners wanted. And the core conveners, of course, um, for the first time doing this conference as a joint effort is the uh, um, fecal sludge management and the Africa Sun. So I think we will be doing well with um, really using the platform or the three days to engage and build, um, strengthen our relations. And um, we had, um, just for those that were not here, we had plenary sessions um, in the morning and afternoon like we'll have today. And in those plenary sessions, we looked at issues of policy development, how we're doing with the implementation of the policies in the continent. We looked at um, the South African policies, the challenges, the implementation, whether our minister, Honorable Minister Quinty, Minister of Water and Sanitation, shared with us our challenges, what we're currently doing in the country. But we also had Amkal, who shared with us how we're doing with regards to implementation of the NGO commitment. And we had also um, the German representative who also spoke to us about the new program that they're going to establish on research to help Africa with water security. Um, and, and we also spoke about what is required, the kind of partnerships that we need to be able to, to provision um, sanitation and hygiene for all in the continent, um, the kind of regulations. We spoke about the first sanitation unicorn, and we did say that there's a lot of opportunities for business in the sanitation sector in Africa, and we should really start looking at those kind of business opportunities. And in the afternoon plenary session, we also had case studies um, on the city of Cape Town, where the officials from the city of Cape Town were talking to us about the famous drought of, um, that hit Cape Town, how they managed to respond or to get out of the drought and not to get the worst way we're talking about the day zeros and so forth. And they also shared with us how the city of Cape Town managed to establish um, sanitation um, and, and hygiene systems for the informal settlement that are based around the city of Cape Town. And we also had um, a colleague from India who was talking about the, um, sharing with us um, the Swachh Bharat uh, mission, which is all about cleaning India, the streets of India, the infrastructure, and so forth. And he also shared with us how they're doing with regards to sanitation um, provision in India, their experiences and their models. Then um, we further moved to... Um, the, the breakaway um, sessions uh, where we looked at um, case studies. We had three tracks. There was a case study track, there was a industry and exhibition track, and there was also an applied research track. And in those sessions, that's where we had even more speakers who were talking about uh, policy implementation in their countries, their experiences, lessons learned, the challenges, um, the regulation, what kind of regulations we need to put in place, the monitoring and so forth. And in the industry and exhibition, we were speaking about the kind of systems that we require to be able to um, provide service, the sanitation services, the capacity building that is needed in the people that provide the services, the use of data uh, tools, and so forth. And then in the applied research we were looking at, because you remember that in the play, opening plenary of yesterday, we spoke about um, the, the, the importance or 
the, the, the need to have more research and innovation because they will enable us to be able to achieve uh, provision of sanitation and hygiene in the continent. So in this session of applied research, we're looking at issues of what are the currently existing technologies and innovation in the continent? Where are we still having the gaps with regards to the innovations and technologies? We looked at the next generation type of sanitation that we need in the continent. And finally, the business and financial models that the continent can use to be able to provide sanitation and hygiene to all our citizens. And we also have dialogues that um, were meant for civil society, development partners, private sector, and also local authorities. And in today's session, um, we're going to look at inclusive sanitation um, utility services. And you may remember that it was very clear in yesterday's plenary that um, we need an enabling environments for us to be able to supply sanitation and hygiene in the continent. Um, there is clear um, opportunities, business opportunities that we are seeing um, if we go in the sanitation route, uh, business uh, opportunities, and that there is um, types of partnership that are required for us to be successful, public, private, um, whatever you can call, and also the need to involve other leaders such as the um, religious, um, the traditional and the faith kind of partners as we implement the solutions. Because if we develop solutions and they are not being um, acceptable by the people that we're developing for, it will not be a win. And we clearly stated the importance of um, developing these innovations that are accessible, sustainable, and also affordable. Because we said that um, if they are too pricey, it will not serve the purpose because normally when we develop these new solutions, we're developing them for the marginalized communities, for the poor communities. So we have to also put in factor the factor of time, uh, the cost in, in the development of those activities. And um, on that note, and today we have a panel of three speakers who are going to be sharing with us their experiences. And we have a representative from South Africa, we have a representative from Senegal, and we also have a representative for the Philippines. And they will all be sharing the information with us. And to see how we can use the public-private uh, partnership to fast track the provision of sanitation and hygiene in the continent, but also learning from other continents, of course, like Asia. So our first speaker, who we've been warned that he's going to deliver his talk in French, and I hope that we all have our headsets, if you are not um, yet acquainted to French language. It will be uh, Mr. Diop, who is the Director General for Delvis Sanitation Initiative in Senegal, and he will be talking to us about how they manage fecal sludge um, from containment to transport, treatment, and, and reuse. Mr. Diop, the floor is yours. Bonjour tout le monde. Alors, euh, je vais vous entretenir aujourd'hui d'un PPP dans le domaine de l'assainissement autonome que, qui s'inscrit en droite ligne par rapport à ce que M. Naïdo, hier matin, nous disait à propos du potentiel qu'il y a dans les bouts de vidange. M. Naïdo parlait de licorne dans le secteur de l'assainissement. Eh bien, ce PPP tend vers ce licorne. Pour créer un licorne, une licorne, pardon, il faut un environnement favorable. Et je vais vous entretenir très rapidement de cet environnement au Sénégal pour qu'on puisse comprendre l'importance de l'implication du secteur public, en tout cas de la volonté du gouvernement. Euh, Dakar est la capitale du Sénégal qui se trouve en Afrique de l'Ouest. Euh, sa surface est très petite. Dakar est juste sur 550 km2. C'est une presqu'île et abrite une population de plus de 3 600 000 personnes. 58 de la population urbaine totale du pays. Euh, L'urbanisation est également très importante euh, à Dakar. On a au moins 97 d'urbanisation. Il y a juste quelques zones rurales, mais assez faibles. Autre contexte, c'est le contexte institutionnel, euh, comment dirais-je, juridique et politique. Le contexte institutionnel a l'avantage d'être très clair au Sénégal. 
nous avons une entité publique qui se nomme ONAS, qui est chargée de l'assainissement dans le pays. Aussi bien la conception, les stratégies que les financements et l'exploitation. Nous avons un contexte juridique très clair également, avec différents codes de l'assainissement, de l'environnement, de l'eau, euh, des normes de rejet des effluents, etc. Donc, c'est assez clair. Il manque juste le moyen transport des bouts de vidange, mais le directeur de l'assainissement nous a rassuré hier matin dans une session que ce dernier moyen va être bientôt disponible. Sur les politiques de l'État, la force aujourd'hui au Sénégal, c'est que l'assainissement est véritablement une priorité pour le gouvernement, et en particulier l'assainissement autonome, puisqu'aujourd'hui, le Sénégal dispose d'un programme national de développement de l'assainissement autonome. Autre élément important, c'est que l'État a décidé d'impliquer le secteur privé dans tout ce qui est exploitation des ouvrages d'assainissement et organisation globale du secteur. À Dakar, nous avons quatre stations de traitement de bout de vidange. Ça fait un peu quelque chose qui paraît extraordinaire en Afrique, parce que généralement, même dans les capitales, on n'a pas une station, ou au maximum, on a une station, parfois deux. Pour dire simplement que le Sénégal a fait beaucoup d'efforts dans ce sens et que les autres pays africains devraient suivre. Euh, ces quatre stations reçoivent un volume total de 2000 m3 par jour. C'est important. Rappelez-vous la population, on a 3 600 000 personnes à Dakar. Et il euh, y a aussi un élément important qui n'existe pas dans beaucoup de pays, mais qui nous semble important, c'est qu'il y a une taxe de dépotage. Parce que le privé, quelle que soit sa volonté, s'il n'y a pas derrière des retombées financières, ben, il ne peut pas s'impliquer. Donc il faut une source d'argent pour faire fonctionner le système. Et au Sénégal, on a une taxe d'assainissement. Euh, une redevance de dépotage dans les stations de traitement de bout de vidange. Quels ont été les challenges pour ce, ce PPP Qu'est-ce qui a motivé le PPP En fait, il est vrai que le Sénégal a quatre stations, mais ces stations sont apparues pour les trois sous-dimensionnées euh, au bout de quelques années, simplement parce que la production de boue est importante, ce qui a causé d'énormes problèmes de fonctionnement de ces stations. Donc l'État a finalement décidé de dire puisque ça ne fonctionne pas trop euh, dans, dans ces stations, puisque l'exploitation également n'était pas profitable, l'État ne dépensait de l'argent pour faire fonctionner le système, essayons de donner au privé. C'est ainsi qu'un appel d'offres a été lancé en 2013 et l'entreprise Delvic a eu le contrat de 7 ans pour gérer ces stations de traitement de bout de vidange. Delvic... Donc, comme je disais, est une entreprise, son histoire est intéressante pour nous tous. Pourquoi je dis Parce que son histoire est fondée sur le proverbe qui dit que pour aller loin, pour aller vite plutôt, vous pouvez aller seul. Mais pour aller loin, il faut aller ensemble. C'est ce que des vidangeurs sénégalais ont compris, deux entreprises sénégalaises actives dans la vidange et qui se sont associées pour répondre à l'appel d'offres et ont gagné. Donc, l'union faisant la force, ils n'ont pas arrêté là, ils ont continué. Ils ont ouvert leurs portes à d'autres experts, d'autres capacités pour venir rejoindre l'entreprise le, et, et la développer vers justement la naissance, la naissance d'une licorne. C'est ainsi que je me suis retrouvé dedans et d'autres personnes également. Donc l'esprit d'ouverture est extrêmement important si on veut avancer assez rapidement. Donc cette compagnie a été créée comme une SARL en 2013 avec un capital de 2000 dollars. Aujourd'hui, elle est devenue une société anonyme avec un capital de 95 000 dollars. 42 employés et un chiffre d'affaires en 2018 autour d'un million 850 000 dollars. Euh, les principaux résultats de cette privatisation, je tente de les synthétiser dans ce slide, c'est qu'on a pu améliorer tous les compartiments des stations. Parce qu'il y avait des problèmes un peu partout, euh, nous avons pu euh, régler la question de fonctionnalité et de performance des stations parce que, justement, nous avons, dès le début, misé sur l'expertise. Delvic dispose d'une plateforme de recherche-développement 
qui a fait beaucoup de tests, beaucoup d'expériences pour améliorer chaque composante des stations de traitement de bout de vidange, dont un des meilleurs succès que nous avons aujourd'hui, c'est de la flocculation que je vais aborder tout à l'heure. Donc les performances sont devenues assez intéressantes en termes de résultats. Euh, nous avons également offert, nous offrons des services aux vidangeurs améliorés en termes d'heures d'ouverture, en termes d'acceptation de, de, du sable qui se trouvait dans leur citerne, parce qu'au Sénégal, dans les fosses, il y a beaucoup de sable. Et à un moment donné, il y a tellement de sable dans les cuves des camions qu'ils ont des problèmes. Avant, l'ONAS ne l'acceptait pas, mais nous, quand on est arrivé, on l'a accepté, mais on l'a valorisé également. On récupère le sable, moyen d'essayer d'en de, de, faire de l'argent. Donc ça aussi, c'est un peu la force du privé, de toujours chercher des niches, dès qu'il y a une opportunité. Parce que pour nous, les problèmes, c'est les opportunités, justement. Nous avons amélioré sensiblement les conditions de travail des, des employés dans les stations. Je ne vais pas nommer tout ce qu'on a fait, mais je dois vous avouer simplement qu'en termes de conditions de travail, euh, on peut dire qu'au Sénégal, nos, nos employés dans les stations ne sont pas les moins lotis, aussi bien en termes de couverture sociale, sanitaire, qu'en termes de salaire, de congés, etc. Nous avons développé une bonne relation avec les vidangeurs, nous avons des rencontres périodiques et nous avons une grande assemblée générale que nous tenons annuellement pour faire le point sur les services que nous rendons, sur leurs attentes, sur leur satisfaction ou non. Et aussi et surtout, nous avons pu augmenter les recettes, les revenus de ces stations. Là, c'est une vue d'une des stations de Dakar qui est largement sous-dimensionnée aujourd'hui. Une station conçue pour 60 mètres cubes jour qui en reçoit 500. Donc, euh, on avait vraiment des problèmes. Ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a installé un système de flocculation qui a été conçu par nos équipes, qui a été réalisé par nos équipes. Tout vient du Sénégal et les résultats étaient tout simplement formidables parce que nous avons pu faire passer la capacité de la station de 60 à 500 mètres cubes jour avec une qualité d'eau autour de 400 mg par litre, ce qui est extraordinaire. Et nous, nous avons multiplié par deux la quantité de boue que nous retenons dans la station, qui est en réalité la richesse que nous recherchons, cette boue noire. En termes financiers, avant la privatisation, disons de l'exploitation, nous avions euh, autour de 124 euh, millions CFA, euh, 124 000 dollars pardon, euh, par an pour les quatre stations. Aujourd'hui, en 2017, on était déjà à 288. Donc ça veut dire qu'on a pu multiplier plus que par deux le chiffre d'affaires et plus que par euh, euh, de 60 à 8 euh, le, le, le bénéfice. Ça veut dire qu'il y a une vraie valeur ajoutée en termes de finances au niveau de la gestion du privé. Et ce qui est encore plus intéressant, c'est que nous avons pu, euh, comment dirais-je, atteindre le seuil de rentabilité défini dans la CDAO, ECOAS, pour une entreprise privée, qui est de 20%. Donc en quatre ans, nous avons pu atteindre ce seuil de rentabilité que nous, avons, que nous, nous allons dépasser à partir de cette année 2019. Quelles sont les conditions de succès, justement, de ce PPP Je pense que l'essentiel des, des critères que nous posons ici sont relatifs au public. Il faut une forte volonté de l'État. Ça, je pense qu'on l'a dit depuis hier, à maintes reprises dans plusieurs sessions, sans cela, ce n'est pas possible. Et des exemples sont là pour le prouver. En Afrique du Sud, le gouvernement est très engagé, il y a du résultat. En Inde, le gouvernement est très engagé, il y a du résultat. Au Sénégal, idem. Je pense que le key point, c'est d'abord l'engagement des autorités publiques. Il faut un cadre institutionnel et juridique clair, sinon là aussi, ce n'est pas possible. Il faut aussi une, euh, une économie d'échelle. Je veux dire, avec une station dans un pays, il est difficile pour un privé de devenir licorne. Il faut que les stations de bout de village naissent en Afrique pour que le privé puisse s'y intéresser. Donc ça, c'est une condition. S'il n'y a pas suffisamment de bout, pas de business autour des bouts. Il faut des contrats qui mettent à l'aise le secteur public, le secteur privé, pardon. Des contrats de un an ou deux ans ne servent absolument à rien. Il faut des contrats relativement longs qui permettent aux privés de planifier des investissements. Enfin, ça c'est relatif au privé par contre, il faut que le privé puisse tirer de l'argent de ses bouts. 
il faut développer des activités à haute valeur ajoutée en utilisant les bouts de vidange. Ces conditions réunies, je pense qu'on peut créer des licornes en Afrique. Et ça, c'est le rêve. C'est le rêve. Mais sans rêve, on ne peut rien faire de, de grand. We have to dream to do big things. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, ma conviction personnelle, c'est que d'ici 2030, on peut atteindre les ODD. C'est possible. Mais pour ça, il faut y croire. Et pour y croire, il faut voir plus grand que nos yeux. Et c'est ça, justement, l'objectif que se fixe Delvic aujourd'hui. Et cet objectif, on va l'atteindre comment En délivrant des services d'assainissement adaptés aux besoins du marché africain. C'est ça la vue générale que nous avons aujourd'hui de l'apport de Delvic dans ce secteur. Et pour ce faire, sur la chaîne de valeur de l'assainissement autonome, nous nous positionnons à l'aval, c'est-à-dire dans le traitement et la valorisation des bouts de vidange. Mais également, nous développons des services de consulting et de formation parce que nous estimons que la coopération sud-sud doit se développer dans ce secteur parce que nous avons à apprendre les uns des autres. Il y a beaucoup de choses qui se font en Afrique, mais qui ne sont pas toujours bien partagées. Aujourd'hui, nous essayons de partager l'expérience que nous avons et nous avons l'honneur de travailler avec une municipalité en Afrique aujourd'hui pour l'accompagner dans un projet de structuration du marché des bouts de vidange. Je veux citer la commune notée urbaine de Yaoundé et je pense que ça doit se développer. J'ai participé récemment sur demande de l'ONAS, qui est l'entité publique sénégalaise, qui a une forte expérience, qui est en train de, de partager avec l'Afrique. Et ils nous amènent avec eux. C'est ce que je disais. Il faut que le public appuie le privé. L'ONAS est sollicité pour faire une formation au Niger pour une nouvelle station de traitement de bout de vidange. L'ONAS dit « Ah, j'ai des privés avec moi au Sénégal qui font des bonnes choses, je les prends avec moi et on va y aller ensemble partager notre expérience. » Ça, c'est intéressant et c'est ça qu'on doit développer dans nos pays. Nous avons également une plateforme de recherche-développement parce que nous estimons également que l'Afrique a des capacités, a un niveau d'expertise aujourd'hui dans ce domaine qu'il doit développer, qu'elle doit développer. Donc nous faisons beaucoup de recherches avec l'Université de Dakar avec d'autres universités, dont une américaine aujourd'hui, avec des centres de recherche comme le euh, Sandec de Eawag Suisse. L'idée pour nous est d'apporter une contribution aussi dans les solutions techniques ou scientifiques qui doivent régler les problèmes euh, de l'assainissement autonome. Ce n'est pas facile de faire du business aujourd'hui dans les bouts de vidange, mais il y a toujours moyen, comme je dis. Quand on rêve, on trouve des solutions. Et les solutions qu'on trouve aujourd'hui pour avancer dans notre vision, c'est de développer des partenariats. Nous avons beaucoup de partenaires aujourd'hui qui s'intéressent à l'assainissement autonome. Et bien entendu, ça aussi, c'est un clin d'œil au secteur privé. Nous avons besoin d'avoir des sociétés qui ont des capacités. Et la première capacité dans une entreprise, c'est le skill, l'expertise, les capacités du personnel. Nous avons besoin d'avoir des personnes de niveau suffisamment élevé pour attirer des partenaires techniques ou financiers. Et nous sommes dans ce, dans ce truc. C'est ce qui nous permet aujourd'hui, en 3-4 ans, d'avoir un chiffre d'affaires qui n'est pas énorme hein, pour une licorne, mais qui est assez satisfaisant pour nous pour le moment. Et vous verrez que ça peut aller très vite. Donc là, c'est juste des résultats obtenus par notre plateforme recherche-développement, dans les toilettes notamment, avec la toilette biofilter que nous installons aujourd'hui avec Oxfam dans la banlieue de Dakar. Le compostage, nous avons fait beaucoup de recherches là-dessus avec l'Institut des sciences de l'environnement de l'Université de Dakar. Les lits de cessage, nous avons apporté beaucoup d'améliorations dans le fonctionnement des lits de cessage à Dakar et la flocculation que nous avons réussi et qui permet véritablement de régler le problème du sous-dimensionnement des stations. Ça, c'est le projet, un des projets qui peut véritablement permettre au sous-secteur d'intéresser le secteur privé, le sous-secteur de l'assainissement. C'est l'omniprocessor. Certainement, tout le monde a entendu parler de cet équipement qui est une machine 
qui permet, à partir des bouts de vidange, de produire de l'eau d'excellente qualité, euh, de l'électricité et des cendres. Ça, c'est des produits valorisables. Et justement, Delvig a eu l'honneur, encore une fois, par la volonté du gouvernement, d'être un des acteurs qui ont piloté euh, cette machine, la version pilote, qui est à Dakar depuis quelques deux, trois ans maintenant, et qui devait servir à démontrer la faisabilité technique du concept qui dit qu'on peut valoriser les bouts de vidange et en tirer des produits économiquement intéressants. Alors, nous avons une grande expérience aujourd'hui avec une équipe interne. Euh, L'ONAS également, qui nous a accueillis sur cette machine, a une grande expérience là-dessus. Et l'objectif maintenant de, 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 de Delvic, c'est de passer à une étape supérieure. Et c'est cette, cette étape supérieure qui sera le début du commencement de notre statut de licorne. Je m'explique. M. Naido a expliqué hier toutes les possibilités qu'on a à tirer de ces bouts. Déjà, ce qu'on sait directement tirer de la boue à partir de l'omniprocessor, électricité, cendres. Avec les cendres, nous projetons de fabriquer du compost organominéral. Parce que j'ai dit d'ailleurs qu'on fait du compost avec les boues. Eh bien, on va mixer la boue et les cendres pour produire un fertilisant organo-minéral. On va également, on a fait des tests déjà avec l'école supérieure polytechnique de Dakar sur les cendres pour voir l'intérêt à les mixer avec, euh, comment dirais-je, avec du ciment pour produire des, des aglos, des briques ou des pavés. Les résultats ont été excellents. Enfin, l'électricité, on sait bien que l'Afrique en a besoin. Et on a la chance au Sénégal d'avoir à côté de chaque station au bout de vidange une station de traitement d'eau usée qui a besoin d'électricité. Et on va faire un partenariat public-privé également pour la vente d'électricité à l'Office national de l'assainissement. Mais ce n'est pas fini. On va démarrer bientôt, je pense au mois de mars, des recherches avec une université américaine sur comment produire des désinfectants à partir des bouts de vidange. C'est une nouvelle euh, perspective qui se dessine et ça rentre dans le cadre de ce que disait M. Naido, notamment les produits chimiques qu'on peut tirer des bouts de vidange. Et c'est ça que j'appelle justement les perspectives qui s'offrent aux entreprises africaines en termes de possibilités de devenir des licornes. Alors ça, c'est mon dernier slide. Mais j'aimerais appeler les, tout le monde ici. Nous, nous croyons à ça, à Delvic. Nous croyons honnêtement qu'on peut atteindre les SDGs nous croyons honnêtement qu'on peut créer des licornes dans le secteur de l'assainissement autonome. Est-ce que vous y croyez Si vous y croyez réellement, je vous prie de répéter avec moi, yes, we can. Very slow, very slow. Yes, we can. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Diop. Yes, we can indeed. Um, I think we must create a slogan or something like that. Since yesterday, we've been saying, yes, it is possible. Yes, Africa can be able to provide sanitation and hygiene to all its citizens. So, yes, we can. And um, <laughs> I love it when you're saying, if you can dream it, you can be it, and you, or you can do it. But the irony of it is, you know when, when you have this thing that keeps you awake at night? and you can't sleep to be able to dream about it. But once you're able to sleep, you will dream about it. So whatever you're thinking about during the day and the kind of strong partnerships you're gonna build in provisioning of this sanitation and all, when we do sleep, we finally get to sleep, we'll be able to dream about it. And the next day when you wake up, that is the thing that you'll be chasing. So let's try to, I hope that we'll be able to sleep. It will not keep us awake and not be able to sleep so that we can dream of the possibilities and the opportunities and be able to succeed in this. But I also do believe that, of course, Africa can be able to achieve this by 2030. We can be able to do well or even better than how we do it in the MDGs, uh, be able to deliver on all the commitment of the NGO um, declarations and so forth. And I also love what you've just said. Um, 
Mr. Diop, that um, as much as we're providing services to people, it is very important. He mentioned that they have an annual gathering where they meet with the beneficiaries and they are able to see that uh, or gauge if the service that they are providing is still what the people want and you are then able to improve on your services. I think that is a very important thing that you're doing because sometimes we end up forgetting that we're actually serving the people and we think or we try to put up what we think is best for them, and it may not be necessarily the case. So consultation, engagements ongoing, it will help to prove um, the services that we offer to the people. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, Ms. Kawong from um, Philippines. She is the general manager of Laguna Water Cooperation. And she's going to be talking to us about the partnerships that they have with their provincial government and um, the Manic Water. And they are uh, specializing in uh, providing pipe to water uh, services in the Philippines. Ms. Kawang. Good morning. Um, to the organizers and uh, delegates of the Africa Sun and FSM5 conference, thank you for welcoming us here in your beautiful city of Cape Town. So let me introduce myself. I'm Shobi, and today I'll be sharing with you how Manila Water has positively transformed the lives of people in the Philippines through the provision of water and sanitation services. So my presentation this morning will revolve around these three key messages. The first is on transforming communities in Metro Manila through the provision of life's basic necessities. Second message is on replicating Manila water success in the province of Laguna, which I currently head. And third is on championing sustainable sanitation in the province of Laguna. Manila water holds the exclusive right to provide water and used water services to the east zone of Metro Manila and its adjacent province, the province of Rizal, serving more than 6, million, 6 million customers. This mandate is pursuant to the concession agreement entered into between the company and the Metropolitan Water Works and Sewerage System on February 1997. The east zone encompasses 23 cities and municipalities spanning 1,400 square kilometer area in Metro Manila plus 14 towns in the Rizal province. We are a publicly listed company with 22 years of experience in the water industry. Manila Water has three fully owned subsidiaries, namely Manila Water Philippine Ventures, Manila Water Asia Pacific, and Manila Water Total Solutions Corporation. Laguna Water, which I will be discussing later in a while, is one of the subsidiaries under the Manila Water Philippine Ventures umbrella. Meanwhile, included under the Manila Water Asia Pacific umbrella are affiliated companies in Vietnam, namely Thudok Water, Kendong Water, Saigon Water, and Kuchi Water Supply. Manila Water Asia Pacific also has an 18% ownership stake of East Water in Bangkok. Manila Water's enterprise value chain um, is founded on a diversified portfolio of products and services, cutting across the entire value chain from water source and development, treatment and distribution, wastewater treatment, as well as other related services such as pipe laying and purified bottled water. This is in line with our aspiration to become a more diverse, multinational, and multi-service water company. During the start of our operation in 1997, although sewerage and sanitation have always been part of our mandate, the provision of water supply preceded used water services, understandably due to the value of water in daily life. So um, for the water service improvement since 1997, our customers have seen significant improvements in their water and wastewater services brought about by our efforts to expand distribution lines, reduce system losses, 
and extend wastewater services to more areas. From only 3.1 million customers back then, at present, we have grown our customer base to over 6.8 million in the East Zone Manila concession, 1.8 million of which are from the low-income segment. These marginalized communities have gained access to affordable and reliable water supply through our flagship sustainability program, the Water for the Poor program. This year, we are celebrating Manila Water's 22nd year, and we are pleased to share that we are running a tight ship in the East Zone Manila concession. We have ensured 24-7 potable water supply, 200% of our dis central distribution system via a network spanning more than 5,200 kilometers of pipelines. We take great pride in having sustained a highly efficient water distribution system at above industry standard non-revenue water level of 12%, enabling us to provide water to our customers even in times of El Nino and other supply shortages. Now, after 22 years and with water service coverage already more than 94%, Manila Water has given parallel focus on wastewater. We are one in saying that there's a need to address the alarming state of our bodies of water. Among various environmental challenges, notable is the worsening pollution of our river systems as a result of continued discharge of untreated domestic used water into waterways and water bodies. Our major river systems in Metro Manila, which includes Pasig, Marikina, and San Juan rivers, Three tributaries that drain to Manila Bay and Laguna Lake have been declared as biologically dead. According to a 2003 Department of Environment and Natural Resources study, more than half of organic pollution into the water bodies comes from domestic sources. In 1997, before Manila water started, only 3% of the metropolis had access to a sewerage system. A vast majority of the population was dependent on the use of septic tanks, which apart from providing only partial treatment, were poorly constructed or worse, ill-maintained. A sizable portion, mostly informal settlers, residing along the banks of rivers and creeks have no sanitation facilities and directly pump their wastes into water bodies, further aggravating pollution of the already dead rivers. Meanwhile, Manila Water's capacity for sanitation services was severely inadequate at that time. So Manila Water has started doing its part to address government's call to intensify sewerage and sanitation infrastructure. The Philippine Clean Water Act, for one, calls for a comprehensive and integrated strategy to prevent and minimize pollution through a multi-sectoral and participatory approach involving all stakeholders. This call to expand wastewater management was echoed in 2008 when the Supreme Court issued a mandamus requiring government agencies to do their respective share in cleaning up Manila Bay. Uh, for our accomplishments in addressing these challenges, Manila Water began to invest heavily in the construction of more sewage treatment plants within its concession area. From only one sewage treatment plant in 1997, Manila Water has built more. We now manage and operate a total of 40 sewage treatment facilities capable of treating a total of 310 million liters of wastewater per day. Some of our biggest facilities to date are the 100 MLD Marikina North STP and the 75 MLD Taguig North STP, which are seen on the pictures. Sewer coverage has increased fivefold to almost 15% with a network of 370 kilometers of sewer lines as of December 2018. 
These make Manila Water one of the largest operators of wastewater facilities that are fully compliant with the government's effluent discharge quality standards. For sanitation, last year, Manila Water has emptied more than 104,000 septic tanks, equivalent to 176,000 households, which have benefited from the company's disludging program for areas not yet connected to the sewer network. Our sanitation program was beefed up by a fleet of 50 vacuum tankers, and the wastewater is hauled by septic tanks, are then brought and treated into, into our two modern septage treatment plants, one of which is the largest septage facility of its kind in Asia. Combining both plants, Manila water is considered to have one of the biggest septage treatment capacities in Asia. Moving on to our used water master plan or the wastewater master plan, well, the solution to reviving rivers and water bodies and restoring them to their old glory involves the concerted efforts of the public and the private sectors. Manila Water has developed an aggressive used water master plan that will ensure sewer coverage of the entire East Zone Manila concession by 2037, so that's the end of our concession, by putting more used water infrastructure at different catchments in the Metro Manila and Rizal province. So we call this the combined sewer drainage uh, systems. So let me move to my second key message on replicating Manila water success in the province of Laguna. Laguna Water is 70% uh, owned by Manila Water Philippine Ventures, and the remaining 30% is owned by the provincial government of Laguna. So we started operations in 2009, and since then, Laguna Water currently provides uh, safe and clean water to more than 100,000 households and establishments in the province of Laguna, particularly the three cities where we currently operate. The average volume of water we produced is 160 million liters per day. And last year, our reven revenue was only on already at the level of 1.3 billion. In a span of nine years, the company has now grown 20 times, more than when we started in 2009. So we are committed to provide our growing customers excellent water services, and the company has already invested 4.4 billion pesos in various water network improvement and rehabilitation, water source upgrade, and water continuity projects, among others. So let me introduce, uh, where is the province of Laguna? The province of Laguna is situated less than two hours away from Metro Manila, south of Metro Manila, and it has a population of about three million people. So this is the summary of our operational performance, uh, our 2018 performance versus 2009 when we started. Let me just cite a few. We have increased the coverage from 14% to 57%, still a lot more to go. And we have increased households served to 102,000 households from 17,000 in nine years. Moreover, non-revenue have been reduced to 17% from 48% in 2009. Moving on to my third and last key message on championing sustainable sanitation for the province of Laguna. The provincial government, so that's the picture of the governor and our president. Um, the provincial government, having seen our track record in improving the water supply in our concession area, gave the green light to Laguna Water to provide environmental services, including but not limited to disludging services and used water services through the amendment of the concession agreement last June 2018. So we have three approaches to sanitation. The first is um, wastewater services uh, for our industrial parks and gated communities. So that's sewage management. And then we have these sludging services for our uh, open communities and subdivisions. 
And um, for our marginalized community customers, we have uh, a, a communal toilet in partnership with the local government unit. And uh, we are also, uh, we just have concluded a pilot study on portable toilet technology as part of our non-grid solution for the base of the pyramid communities. So Laguna Water is managing the 22-kilometer sewer network system of Laguna Techno Park, one of the largest industrial zones in the Philippines, which houses around 200, 200 companies. The sewer network transports the domestic used water to the Laguna Techno Park sewage and septage treatment plant, an average of 5.5 million liters of domestic used water per, per day from the companies in LTI. So we are charging our customers in LTI 50% of their basic charge on water for the sewer charges. This is the picture of our sewage and septage treatment plant in LTI. Uh, it has the capacity to treat 11 million liters of wastewater uh, per day from companies and industries in LTI. Aside from that, the LTI sewage and septage treatment plant has an additional treatment capacity of 70 cubic meters of septage, which will treat the septage that we dislodge from the households and various establishments within the province of Laguna. So last September, uh, in 2018, Laguna Water commenced our desludging services in the service areas that we, we currently hold. The company has laid out a five-year desludging program to ensure that all our customers will be provided with a service. Desludging service is one of Laguna Water's flagship environmental programs with the amendment of the concession agreement which allows Laguna Water to include 20% environmental charges in its tariff structure. So uh, the 20% is already tucked in on the tariff um, starting uh, October of 2018. In partnership with uh, local government units and the Manila Water Foundation, Laguna Water is planning to set up communal toilets for our base of the pyramids when space is available. Laguna Water ensures that the septic tanks are properly designed so that we can then properly dislodge and remove the septage for proper treatment. So this is a picture of one of the pilot uh, communities in Metro Manila, which we are also replicating in Laguna. And for the portable toilet solution, Laguna Water secured a grant from Grand Challenges Canada to conduct a two-phase pilot study that facilitates the scalability and replicability of the portable toilet system model. The study covers a technical and business model assessment of the portable toilet solution, which involved testing of two prototype systems within 30 target households in the city of Santa Rosa in Laguna. The two prototype systems by vendors Lixil and Luat were evaluated through a multi-criteria analysis. The MCA scores were based on five identified criteria. Number one, financial. Two, environmental. Three, health and safety. Fourth, customer satisfaction. And fifth is the ability to scale up the business. Each criteria was given specific weights and corresponding scores for each technology. Overall, Luat system is the recommended PTS with a total score of 87%. And the customers preferred the Luat model uh, in terms of um, the Luat system is preferred in terms of financial, environmental, and customer satisfac satisfaction criteria. Currently, Laguna Water is into discussion with uh, Foundation and the DNR to secure initial funding for the capex of the toilet units as the base of the pyramids cannot fully shoulder the cost of the toilet. Based on the study, BOP test customers' perceived value of the toilet is just one-third of the actual cost of the toilet units, and we need to find a way to help them shoulder 
the remaining cost of the toilet. Apart from exploring new technologies in wastewater management, we at Laguna Water also invests in IEC programs to instill aw awareness and proper sanitation to our customers. Wastewater management seems to be a new concept for most people in the areas that we serve, and many do not know that wastewater in their septic tanks should be collected and treated every five years. To bridge this gap, Laguna Water launched an information education communication campaign that goes to different barangays, cities, and municipalities in Laguna to educate the communities on the practice of proper sanitation with focus on wastewater management. Awareness and knowledge about wastewater management would help break social norms which can result to companies change to which can result to communities change behavior towards the practice of proper sanitation. So the program, our IEC program, in fact, recently won the Gold Anvil Award. It was given by um, one of the top um, PR companies in the Philippines. And um, that's a result of our efforts on um, spreading the um, uh, information about wastewater uh, services. Lastly, this is my last uh, slide. Uh, in Laguna Water, we always promote the importance of a collaborative effort between the government, Laguna Water as the service provider, and the individuals or the customers that we serve in our goal to achieve clean, one, clean water and sanitation for all. The government's share is to create and implement the laws while the service provider like us ensures that we are able to deliver adequate and efficient water and wastewater services while the individual or our customers are encouraged to support the programs of the government and do their share in ensuring that the environment is safeguarded. Thank you and have a pleasant day to all. Thank you, Ms. Kawong. Just before I introduce the last speaker, and we promise today we won't take too much time off your tea break. Before I introduce the last speaker, just to tell you that the presentations will be available. So in a few weeks' time, we'll all receive um, links where we can download the presentations, because we've been asked that questions. And the second announcement is that all the francophone um, participants, you are asked to please gather at the um, Susanna booth at 2 o'clock, all the francophone participants. And going, going to our last speaker for this morning plenary, her name is Ms. Lopuani. She's from Mpilo Yabantu franchisee. She's a franchisee. She will explain what Mpilo Yabantu means. Um, but they, she, and she's going to be sharing with us uh, the model that they are, they are using, which is um, basically the social franchising model that she's working on together with the government and the municipalities in South Africa. Ms. Lupuani. <laughs> Good morning to you all in the house. My name is Notawe Lopuana. I'm from the Eastern Cape, one of the remote that have the remote areas. Mm, I'm here to share my experience or my story of success as a franchisee. Uh, the journey of me becoming the social franchisee for operation and maintenance of schools, water, and sanitation started in 2009 when the department in Butterworth District invited all the service providers in their database as building constructors to come for interviews. 
And those interviews were being conducted by Amanza Bantu and his subsidiary company, Impilo Yabantu. And I happened to become one of the selected women. Okay. And then the Impilo Yabantu took us to series of trainings. We were trained on first on occupational health and safety. We were trained on how to use first aid kit when we are on site. We were taken on on-site training, cleaning the school's abrusion facilities. Then, after all that training, we became the franchisee. And then I want to tell you, how does this franchisee, franchisor, work or operate? It's just any, it, it, I would compare it with Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, we see Kentucky Fried Chicken all over the world. But the owners of those shops, of, of, of that Kentucky Fried Chicken, are different. But what they share, they use the same spice. So you get the same taste. I, I, I'm sure even if I go to China, I'll get, when I, when I go to Kentucky, to Kentucky, I'll get the same taste that I, I get when I'm here in South Africa. Yeah. Then again, comparing the, 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 this model of franchisee, franchisor, with Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's like Amman Zabandu is babysitting us. That is the franchisees. He, he, he is giving us all the necessary support so that we do the good work when we are on site. So he, they are babysitting us. Then, what services do we offer as Impilo Yabantu franchisees? We do cleaning of schools, ablution facilities. We do pit emptying. We, 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 we teach health and hygiene, menstrual health and hygiene in schools. We are able to collect schools' data information using the map, the Momenzi map. That, that, that's the new technology because before we used the, the assessment form to get the, 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 to get the understanding of school sanitation condition. Before we do anything, we would conduct that survey so that, that I get the, 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 the real picture of the school and so that anyone who has not been to the school, I'm able to give him that information. So the Department of Education knows each and every school that I've been to because that app we are using, when I finished collecting all the data, I just click, then it goes, it, it will go to my office, it will go to the Department of Education. So they have the clear picture of what is going on around their schools. Uh, we also do e assemble address. When I go to clean the school, we do first the assemble address. What, what, what do I do in that assemble address? 
we talk about personal, general personal hygiene and demonstrate hand wash. As I, uh, as I speak, I'm sure you will enjoy the, 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 the viewing of, of the pictures that are rolling there because this is what I'm faced with every day. Okay. In, in, 20, in, in, in 22 months, in the last 22 months, we've been busy with the health and hygiene, menstrual health and hygiene in, in 302 schools. And that program is being funded by o African Development Bank through WRC. So we are working together on that program. And then what do we do? We, 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 we go to school, we do the survey as, as, as we always do to get, the inf to get all the data about the school, the information about the school. We, we clean the school so that we get to know what, I what needs to be repaired. The, we get to know the, 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 the condition of those toilets so that we are able to go back again to do the minor repairs. Because ours is not building. We are not the, con the, the, the contractors. We, 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 well, how can I put it? We, we just do health and hygiene awareness. How should school keep their facilities healthy and clean? So that's what, so that's what we do. So we, on, on conducting Gengoku, all that, we help schools set up their school sanitation clubs. The, those clubs include stakeholders like the principal, the, the LO teacher, the SGB, the, the caretaker, if the school has got the, take, the, the caretaker, and also learners, balancing them. If, taking, if we take 10, 10 boys, we have 10 boys, we, we have 10 girls in, in, in that club. Then we train those clubs and as we train them, we also help them develop their proposed action plan. Then, as we train them, we train them to be the ambassadors of their school's water and sanitation, so that when I'm not there as e employee to franchisee, they jump in because I've trained them on how to keep their toilets clean. Mm. Then <laughs> we train them. <laughs> okay, okay, you will forgive me because I, I'm, I'm not familiar with this kind of setup, you see? <laughs> For the past 10 years, I've been to the sites. And I, I, I'm not, I, I, so even my shoes now, because I'm not used to a high heel, I'm, <laughs> I'm used to a safety shoe. So I, 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 I'm trying to be comfortable, but, <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> I promise you I will get there. Okay, the committee must invite me also ne to the, to, for, for the next coming FICAS large management, and then you will see me then. <laughs> so, as we train those school sanitation clubs, we help them, we give them the questionnaire, so as to 
so that I get to know what, what knowledge do they have about their school sanitation. Né? And then we help them we help them identify their school environmental hotspots. And in the process, we develop, they develop their proposed action plans. That plan becomes their plan for managing their own toilets as to promote human dignity and respect. It must show, their plan must show how are they going to assist, how are they going to support those vulnerable, vulnerable ones. It must talk about what they are going to do so as to keep their toilet infra infrastructure in good condition and in repair. And once more, in, in, in that training, we talk about personal hygiene, puberty stage up to the menstrual health and hygiene. We also talk about how to support girls in their periods. We discuss their rights. This has become a problem in our schools because no, you can't take the learner to go and clean the toilets. Before, before 1994, those were manuals. That's what we did. We will clean our toilets by ourselves. But now, you can't take a child to go and clean the toilets. We are faced with that. So we discuss the learner's rights. And as we discuss those rights, I emphasize that the right goes along with the responsibility. They must not forget that. And it's on them, on that club, to, 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 to watch those that vandalize the school's sanitation. Like in, in their breaks, what I've studied is that when they, when they are on break, they always play inside the toilets. I don't know why, but they always play in the toilet. And that time, there is no adult to tell them that this is wrong. So that's why we have trained those learners so that, because the, 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 the club will be among them all the time. So it's easy to work for them to say this is wrong, what you are doing is wrong. Don't throw the paper in the toilet. Then we talk about the roles and responsibility of each stakeholder in the club, like the principal. What is, what is the role of the principal? What is the role of the safety officer if they have any cleaner? What is the role of the, of the, of the learner? What is the role of the SGP? Coming to my personal growth as a social franchisee through a series of trainings and workshops conducted by Impele Abandu, our businesses as franchises were established. We were able then to create more jobs because I'm standing here representing 22 franchises. So if one of us has got five workers, meaning which in total we have, the, the, the model has been able to create more than 220 jobs. These workers also are trained. They are inoculated. Uh, safety is our prior priority. They are ino inoculated. They are taken to, to clinics for, for checkups. And then they are also taken to on-site trainings. Mm -hmm. Our companies are registered to CIDB grading and have grown from 
zero CIDP grading to up to two, three, and four grading. That's our company. Yes. We always and we always comply. The kind of relationship that we have built with the school's managers, that is the principals, has opened us doors for being requested to quote in for, for minor plumbing, for dislodging, and also for toilet seats, to change the toilet seats. There are those great R learners there that have been attached to schools. So, so every school has got the problem of big seats. So those little ones can't use those seats. So they are in that process of changing this, some of their, their seats into small ones so that they also accommodate them. And then our, our workers do extra jobs for their communities because the skills they have, they have received through the program, like doing minor plumbing, dislodging, they, they, dislodging as they know how to safely dispose the sludge, they, they are able to do them those to share those skills in the communities. The model, the knowledge, the skills we acquired through as franchisees through the program have helped us to develop our businesses. We are focused, focused and we are very passionate about our core business. As women in, the, in this sector of, in this sector, we are more powerful because of the knowledge that we have received through the program. And they say knowledge is power. I'm rich because I have a knowledge and I'm hoping to be rich in money wise in the meantime. You know this is an investment. Then lessons, le lessons learned at the time is against me. Lessons learned uh, as I interact with the schools, what I've learned is that when all the, all the stakeholders are involved in any activities, in any activity, it becomes easy for them to participate and they cooperate and then it's easy to accomplish your goals. That, that is when you do things together, the workload becomes easy. I've also learned that the attitude has changed. There is change in behavior in those learners in, and in, also in the communities as they now know the importance of keeping toilets clean. Mm, okay, now the challenge. We must come to the challenge. The challenge is that lack of funding for us to, to keep going. As I speak now, we have left schools with those action plans. We have to go back and assist them as they develop those plans and as assist them and monitor them so that their toilets are safe. And all thanks to the FSM committee, SM, SF, FSM 5 committee. Thanks to WRC, thanks to Oliver, the managing director of Amanza Bantu, and also thanks to Phil, the general manager of Impiloya Bantu. And, all, and I also thank me. <laughs> and I thank you.